Hey everybody, this is Paul. I'm super excited to be here today at the George Farm where they farm Sumo Citrus and it's the height of the Sumo Citrus harvest. So tell us, what is a Sumo Citrus, Tim? Well, Paul, I'm glad you asked because a lot of people have some misconceptions about what exactly a Sumo is. You'll hear people say Sumo oranges or Sumo mandarins, neither of which are technically true. And as we all know, technically is the best type of true. They're actually a hybrid. They're three quarter mandarin and one quarter uh, navel orange. So you uh, shouldn't sorry. even call them an orange, right? Uh, you, or a mandarin. The, well, the, the technical name for them would depend on where they're from. But um, so, yeah, they call them Sumo Citrus. That's the brand name. And that's kind of like saying Kleenex. Um, Sumo Citrus had the first decapon harvest in California. And decapon is this piece of fruit, and it's a, it actually had come from Japan. It was developed in Japan in the early 70s, um, and it wasn't a very useful or interesting variety at all. Actually, it was kind of a big failure, uh, really dead on arrival, um, because it's a very, very difficult tree to grow. And so if you take the time and put the care in and learn a process where it probably took five or ten years for the... Uh, a single person to learn how to grow these correctly. Mm -hmm. um, then he came out with this thing, it was called the Decapon. Um, it's a hybrid between a, a mandarin um, and a sweet orange is then crossed with another mandarin. So it's three quarters mandarin and one quarter sweet orange. And when I say sweet orange, I mean sort of similar to a Valencia, something that would have seeds in it, not like your standard navel orange. And these are seedless, right? These are seedless. Mm -hmm. Now they're not always seedless. When you buy a Sumo, you shouldn't have a seed in it because it's part of the quality control program to exclude all seeds. Okay. But these can have seeds with them and it depends strictly on pollination. So these will cross pollinate with some, but not all varieties of citrus. And when, when they cross pollinate is when you get a seed. Seeds, okay. yep. Yep. And now if you if you were to say have a grove of navel oranges next to these, the bees would go back and forth and nobody would have a, a problem at all. But if you had, say, A.W. Murcotts, which is a seeded variety of mandarins, mm -hmm. that mixes with the sumo pollen um, and it actually will cause you to have seeds. So you then grow. you would have a, a, lot of, a lot of seeds or just a few? Or it depends. Um, I have found, on our block this year, I've found two seeds total wow. so far. Okay. Um, there have been years where we had maybe five or six seeds in a single sumo, and then that was maybe 5% of the fruit. So even sometimes you might, maybe the bees on your farm aren't necessarily causing a problem with your neighbor's fruit, but maybe the bees have a fellow traveler. Okay. And he might bring the pollen in from a few miles away. That could be a problem. Could have to do with growing conditions. Uh, you'll find one theme as we talk about these is I'm going to say growing conditions a lot. These things, you, these things you are at the mercy of this year's weather every year. So I can see because you have setups, you have trellises, you have different rootstocks you're experimenting with. So take us on a tour, show us more about this whole process of growing these amazing fruit. This is a rain cover. This is our first iteration of an experimental rain cover. And we just basically... So this is version one. Yeah, so actually yeah. Th this originally was gonna be a vertical trellis. Dad had seen some trellises in another country and he was like, oh, I could just install. So we came in and this is before I was here, but he augged these holes out and then installed all these, you know, peeler cores um, and got the wires running. And he was gonna try trellising a row and see how a vertical trellis worked. Eventually gave up on that because how we were lin how we were pruning the trees didn't lend themselves to a vertical trellis. You kind of want to prune it like a lollipop. Um, you want one middle piece coming up, and then you want some number of uh, vertical scaffolds coming out, and then they have laterals coming off of those. Okay. So you really want to try this tree's a good example. You really want to try to have two layers of laterals, like a lower layer and an upper layer. Okay. Um, and that gives you a chance for this bottom fruit to still get sun. If you were to keep it like a hedge all the way around, all this bottom Too much down shade. there wouldn't be getting sun. Okay. Yeah, and then you'd get that knot. So sunlight is real the key to getting a good fruit. Yeah. I mean, look at these beautiful sumos right here. It's just stunning. I mean, these are ready to pick, right? These are yeah, ready to these go. Yeah, these are ready. These, are, these would be pretty good. 
We'll, we'll, we'll pull one out of here. And so what was the purpose of less rain? Why did you do this? So since the beginning, we once one year there was a, a big rain during rain maturity and we realized over half of the fruit rotted on the tree. Uh, difference between picking traditional citrus and picking this is this has to be tree ripe. It's not gonna sit in the, it's not gonna sit in the packing house and become good over time. You can settle out a little bit of the acid, but you can't develop the fruit anymore. Whereas you can pick a green navel and put it in a cold storage and gas it and it'll continue to grow itself a little bit. Okay. Um, but not with sumos. That not with sumos. Work. You Gassing them doesn't add color. Um, so they're, as, they're usually about as colored as the day you pick them. If you let them cure for a while, sometimes you can maybe get 5% more color probably won't but it's minimal it's minimal yeah so you'll run into a lot of trouble with that um you can cure out the acid so if you have you know your really tart tangy fruit and you want it to settle out and be more f sweet with that sort of distinctive sumo -y flavor um if you if you cure it at the right heat and humidity um you can actually draw some of that acid out um but it's not going to be it's not going to develop and get more sweet over that time. You can reduce the acid, but you can't add more sugar. So the sugar, the, the, the sugar score won't change. It's just the acidity yeah. uh, and the perceived flavor of it. Yep. Okay. Um, and so because these things have to be picked tree ripe while they're on the tree, if the rind is sort of opened up, think of it like your pores opening up. Um, you might not want to like go from a hot bath and, you know, rub oil on your face, mm -hmm. you know, like they say in your shower, with cold water because it closes your pores. Close the pores, right. Well, think of a sumo like a, like a person in a bathtub or in a hot tub, right? That water gets on your skin and it starts to get pruney and your skin's more porous once it's pruney. And so these things will sponge up the water. You get that water in there and as this thing gets pruney, it's more susceptible to rot. Same way that uh, you'd be more susceptible to like, you know, if you, if you rubbed a pumice on your hand when it was wet, a lot more skin would come off than yep. if you did it while it was dry. Well, it's the same sort of concept. Okay. Except the pumice is some sort of fungus or mold that's going to grow on the fruit. Um, and you're going to, you know, the rubbing is just that stuff growing. Okay. So the longer you sit in the water, it'd be better for it to rain six inches in the day and then dry out the next day than for it to rain three quarters of an inch over a week because okay. it would stay wet. And that wet is just a breeding ground for bad. You so want not it. like dragon fruit. Dragon fruit, the same thing. If your yep. fruit stays wet, it breeds cactus rust. Yep. Or some type of fungus. And the other thing that we get is when you want wind, but you don't want warm after the rain. Because if you get it wet and then get it warm, boom, breeding ground for everything bad. Uh, okay. Yep. So you actually kind of need cold weather to stay around for a little bit after the rain until the fruit dries out. So, so you're really at odds of the elements. Well, yeah. And we did lose, you know, we, we packed out less than 40% of our sumos last year because we had six inches of rain spread out over two weeks in December. And that's when the fruit was mature on our ranch. We threw 30% of it on the ground during harvest. And then after that, less than 50% less than of it packed. So if you do the math there, you're like 35% of the sumos that were on, on the trees. And, and didn't you know, make it. didn't make it. And then farming expenses are tight this year because you know we do have a farming, farming fund available that we keep for things like that, but you never expect to get hit that hard. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you but know. But this season's different, right? Because now you've already picked early, right? So we picked the earliest we've ever picked this season. That's why you can actually see, you don't always see sumos before Christmas. That's, yeah, that's, that's what I was saying. Rare. I don't remember yeah. them being in the stores. Yeah, it was always January I saw right? yeah, stores. Yeah, and we tell people the sumo, you know, the sumo season starts in January or sometimes February. You know, there's been years where it's like, late January, early February by the wow. time it gets out. This was an early year. The sugar was really high. We had an excellent, we had an excellent summer for um, color and sugar, but a terrible year for size. So the sumos are everywhere. The sumos are smaller this year. And so they're smaller due to the environmental factors. Yeah. And okay. we don't always know exactly why we're, you know, when we have small fruit here, we always kicking ourselves that we didn't farm it right but it was small fruit everywhere. It could um, just be an off year, right? Like, yeah, and it, and it can be a complete off year. Last year, we had, I was calling them Cthulhu, but the little navel here was popping out the bottom. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you'd see like these tendrils coming out and it would literally look like tentacles coming out the bottom. You'd have five or six of them just pu puking out. 
And, but that didn't happen to any this year. I, I haven't seen one like that this okay, year. Because I haven't seen one either. Maybe 10% of the fruit was like that last year. Wow. Yeah. And there are, you know, there are other aberrations that we see. Things like there's some distinctive marks you might see one year that you've never seen on a different year. Um, and then, you know, not every sumo has a navel on it, actually, which is oh, pretty yeah. interesting. So this is a sumo. This is the same exact variety on the same exact tree. Um, I'll get you two closer to each other. Yeah. See, one's got a navel, one doesn't. It's not going to affect the flavor positively in one way or the other. It's just this has to do with the temperature and the humidity and the conditions at the time of bud. And okay. so you'll notice this one's smooth and this one's rough. Yeah. Some years, like last year, all of our smooth fruit never sugared up. Oh, okay. Um, I think that had something to do with the rain. And we had a really weird first and second bloom last year. The temperatures were not very high. Um, the temperature differential was not very high. So you want, you know, cold and warm. Um, higher temperature differential tends to give you a nice lumpier looking sumo that, that sugars up better. So you would want it to go from like 50 to 75 uh, yeah, degrees if it's, in a day. Yeah, okay. you know, if you have a 25 degree temperature swing, that would be great. If you okay. have a 10 degree temperature swing, you're probably gonna get a lot of smooth fruit and maybe even a lot of small fruit. Um, so but would it affect the flavor or just the smoothness? It'll absolutely affect the flavor. It can't affect now, the flavor, okay. Because growing conditions are different in Japan, they want the smooth fruit there because the smooth fruit sweetens up better there. Oh. Our rougher fruit tends to sweeten up better. Okay. But it could depend on the year and it could depend on the tree and it could depend on the piece of fruit. So it's not a guarantee that if I pick a smooth one and a rough one, which one's going to be sweeter. Okay. Who actually coined the name Sumo Citrus? So when that was the company that my father was working for when they started they basically um they did some focus group stuff down in la um and and they learned um they learned that everybody every every citrus that has a two syllable name sells better oh, shit. <laughs> so like a sweetie wow. or a cutie Sumo. or a halo so it's all down to syllables so yeah it was actually a syllable thing um oh, and then sumos were just uh, they also found one of the things that's very fascinating about this variety is it was strictly a Japanese variety for a long time and people were really interested in Japanese culture and Japanese fruit is better than American fruit but people are also really interested in local and fresh so the draw of sumo that people really bought into was Japanese style raised locally Okay. So you see, you see, like, they wanted to sort of lean into the Japanese aspect of it, I think was part of the reason that sumo became the, the trend. Kind of like pay a little tribute to the culture too, I guess, right? Yeah. Well, and it, all the, all the budwood, there's, uh, there's three places to get budwood from for the variety, which is called Shiranui is the original name for it. Um, but you can get it from Brazil. You can get it from China. If it's from Brazil, it's called Julietas. There was a Japanese gentleman who went there in the 80s, I believe, um, and he brought the budwood over there and he started a Julieta program. There's the Decapon, which is the budwood from Japan, mm -hmm. which is what the sumo is based off of. And there's the Shiranui, which is the budwood from China. China. So if you were to get one of these trees at a nursery, it might say Decapon or Julieta or Shiranui. And, that and those are all... all the same, they're the same variety. They're not from the same mother tree. So there could be subtle differences in the fruit. Possibly. Hypothetically. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean, there could be. Everything that's a sumo citrus all comes from the same packing house and it's all decapon okay. budwood. And anybody in the sumo program would have would be buying their trees from sumo or, or from AC Foods. Which would be decapon. Yeah. Okay. Which would be decapons. Um, so as far as actual sumo sumos, they'll all be from the same two mother trees that originally came to the United States. Okay. Uh, you know, in the late nineties probably, or early two thousands. So about 20 years ago. Yeah. A little more. So the, the first sumo grove was planted in 2008. Oh wait. Yeah. Uh, there might've been a small planting before that, but the first year that people were out there planting was 2008. And then the first harvest was 
2011 was like a small sort of preview harvest and then 2012 was the first or no 2011 was the first commercial harvest and then so in year two you can kind of get a few fruit off if you'd like to but they actually what when you plant these trees as a baby you actually rip all the fruit off of it all yeah the you time. don't want it no to fruit on it set his mind to grow in again channel the growth how old are these trees here so these trees are 2008 so oh wait yeah and we're we're so learning years old we don't know how long a sumo tree will last if it's maintained properly. And like so, it's it's final old age, you don't know? Yeah, these guys may actually already be pra past their prime. We're going to uh, do some really experimental pruning on them this year to see if we can revive them because we really didn't get as good quality out of this block as we have in the past. Do you know the but average? Why? I mean, no offense, this these fruit look beautiful. So how, well, how you expected more from I mean, this? Yes. We why, expected, bigger? They should have been bigger? They sh yeah, they're tiny. Like all this, all this fruit is tiny to me. This is okay. this is an eight, or this is maybe even a nine. These are these are not good. We want, you know, we want this should be a small piece of fruit. Right now, okay. it looks like a big piece of fruit. Yes, we want these big ones like this, like this guy right here. I want every fruit That's on my ideal. tree to look like that. Okay, um, or bigger even. You know, they do get bigger than that. Yeah, anyway, I saw some big ones earlier. Do you know what the average age of like a general orange tree is? Like, what's what's a, a like the growing Naval trees will stay in the ground for as long as you as long as you're making money off of them. Really, I mean, there's there's hundred year old navels out there. Oh wow! Some of the okay. Washingtons have been around for a long time. Wow. Um, oh, man, that's good. That, that's not common because a lot of the a lot of the older trees weren't done on rootstocks. Um, what they were just grown from seed. I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly how it used to work, or ones. if they were gra if they're grafted into different things. Or, well, all you know. So all citrus is actually grown from a seed. You start with a seedling and a scion, uh -huh. and, the, and then you bud it on. But they didn't have specialty rootstocks. A lot of it was just sour root, which is a really old rootstock that's really susceptible to disease. Yes, that's makes, a bad one, right? Makes good fruit, but it's susceptible to disease. You guys want to go see some harvest? Yeah. yeah. Going back to that quality issue we were talking about before, where every little piece is something different, something more involved. Again, the, the reason the sumos cost more in the store is because of all this care that goes in at every level. Um, so we don't use, like typically the way you would harvest is you'd have these big four by four pallets or bins that sit on the ground and you'd fill a bag, clip, clip, clip into a bag and then you just dump that bag um, into a big bin and then a forklift comes and bounces that bin through the field and then dumps it onto a semi and that semi drives away. Well, here we have a little bit of a different process. If you look down here, you'll see our trailer. So these are actually the same trailers they use to pick stone fruit, like peaches or plums. So that real sensitive, soft, you know, you got to kind of pick the, the peach tree right. You can't pick it and let it sit for a month like you can an orange. Uh -huh. um, so we're, we're treating these almost more like stone fruit than we would treat citrus. Mm. So there's a specialized harness the guys put on and then they strap it into a bin or into a uh, tote and they can only put two layers deep on that tote and then they have to set that individually in a stack one pallet is six stack uh eight stacks of six high and so you get 48 per pallet um and then of course at this point you also have a big concern with food safety with the bin the bin sits there and it's underneath uh it's never touching anything and then a bag well you've got these totes and then People have a tendency to want to set a tote down and pick into it, and you can't do that. You've got to keep it strapped up. So it's a lot more supervision, for one. And for two, it's also a lot more intensive because now instead of filling an 80-pound bag, I'm filling 15 pounds of tote or 20 pounds of tote. And so I'm walking back and forth. It's a lot more walking. It's a lot more... Um, another thing we do to, to conserve quality is... If you pull on the top of these fruits, they're very sensitive. So if I'm clipping a navel, I might have my clippers and I might have my bag and I would just kind of pull on it out like this, hold it out and then clip it and it'll go straight into my bag. Well, with this guy, I'm never going to do that because as soon as I've, you might even be able to see it in here. As soon as I've pulled on that a little bit, I've now put little micro cracks in there. You see the little wetness. Um, now this piece of fruit's gonna rot faster than any other piece of fruit because I pulled on the top. So you might as well keep that one and eat it. So I'll be point. eating this one for dessert tonight. Another problem you can run into here is maybe I'm not being very careful. I clip this off. Now I've got another fruit next to me. 
and I'm gonna stab that piece of fruit in the toe. That one's not gonna make it to packing now. So it pushes it down? Like... Uh, so uh, basically this will stab a piece of fruit next to oh, it. Oh, so now this, I understand. So this, yep, I got you, I got you. Now, now, that's, now gonna be... that's gonna be rotting before it got comes it. out. Got it, okay. Yeah, so so you now have you've got another very careful. So you're making sure every single person here and there is not leaving these long picos. You're not put it, packing stuff that's too green. Um, so do you need not extra slicing the training fruit. then? Like you have to be much more careful with a sumo than a Valencia. Yeah. Okay. Um, so these are less forgiving. So they're not very forgiving at all. You can't, you know, you're picking them out of the tote. You're setting them directly down right into the tote. So no tossing them. You're not tossing them. You're not juggling them. You're not even dropping it this far. Up here, if you want to kind of find your way up, you can stand on that little nugget because you're good at balancing. So this is the fruit in the tote. We actually have to strap this down. We've got these bars on the side in case there's any wobbling back and forth. Because this ranch is on a hillside, it's even more complicated than normal. But you're also worried about stuff like, you've got to instruct people not to put it three high because this will get another pallet on top of it and it'll smash the fruit. And so that one would put everywhere, juices on it and maybe rot. Everywhere that that juice touches will rot a piece of fruit. So now you've got another problem, right? So, so these ones are too tall over here. So you yeah. want them. Well, you can see that one's already kind of be leaking yep. because it was it was too much in one tote. I see. So you're fighting stuff like that. So now I'm that was gonna be over here. I gotta move open. these out. Maybe too late for this guy already. Um, but it's it's just more to be careful of and more to keep your eye on. And again, all that supervision costs money, and all the being careful and you know takes more time, which is also more money. And these bins you said are only for sumo, right? You don't use these bins for other types of citrus fruit. Nope, we're not picking any other citrus fruit into toads at this point in time. to irrigate out of a reservoir. We'll get into that in a minute. This is our reservoir. We pour water in from the irrigation district and it's gonna come, if you if you sneak through here, you can see, comes out these white pipes over here. The far right pipe will be from the irrigation district and the middle one will come from our, our well, if we ever wanted to pull well water up, which we prefer not to because that messes with our nitrogen balance. Um, so the general process would be, we put water into this, clean water. We use a little bit of pond dye just to keep the algae down. Um, and then we'll, there's a deep straw in here. This is our main pump. So this pump sucks, it's got a 16 foot deep straw. Oh wow. And there's a inlet underneath the water, probably about eight feet, eight feet down in the water right now. The reason our reservoir is so full, even though it's this time of year, is we're actually using it to recharge our groundwater for our well right now. Okay. So we can take at the end of the year, if our irrigation district water isn't all used up, I can put it into the ground and then we get something like 60 to 40% of it back through our groundwater. It's called a GSA. It's a groundwater resources something. We can look up what that so is. So it's a good exactly. thing for you to use less so then you can put it back in your well. Yes, but m mostly it's when there's going to be, they've just redone the water here. Okay. So during droughts, they're going to be metering people's pumps now. We've actually lost the Frank Kern Canal down south um, near Bakersfield. has actually lost like eight feet of elevation. Oh, wow. Over the past 30 years. Um, and it's still sinking at something like one to two inches a year. And that's simply from groundwater depletion and then the soil just sinks down. So overuse so, of the water, pulling too much water out. Yeah, all over the valley we've pulled way too much water out over and over. So what they're doing now is they're metering wells and then they have these, uh, you know, groundwater strategic resource area, GSA. Um, and then they'll use those to monitor how much groundwater you have per acreage. And you can get more basically by being a good citizen and refilling. So okay. if there's a year where there's extra water, your district may have free water available for you to for you to bank, it's called water banking. So it's water banking. Yeah. And so what you do is you say, 
give me this water for free. I'll pay the surcharge to deliver it. And then I'll put that in the ground. And when the drought comes, I can pull 40% of that back out or 60% of that back out. And that's dependent on GSA that you're in. Okay. So part of the, this is a dual purpose pond. It's our, it's our uh, reservoir so that we can keep a constant stream of water coming in without losing any head pressure. But it's also a uh, recharge basin. And what's the volume? How much, what's the size, roughly? Uh, that's a good question. So it's 200 feet on each side. Um, and I would say we could probably store maybe an acre foot and a quarter in here. Maybe a oh, little bit less a good than amount. that. So a, fair, a fairly large amount, but you know, not enough for a whole season by a long okay. shot. So you probably use what, two, two, the, this amount times two for one season? Yeah, we're probably using, uh, on a hot summer, we'll use north of two and a half acre feet. Okay. Um, but on a on a normal year, maybe 2.2 is probably a good guess. And do you inject uh, the nutrients? Do you fertigate? Like, what, what's that yeah, process? Yeah, so the water will come in here, comes out of this straw. We've recently actually, because we're obsessed with redundancy, because who knows what will go wrong all the time with farming. This is a brand new pump, and we, we put this in as a backup. But as we put it in, we realized we had 50 feet of head pressure or 50 PSI of head pressure coming from the irrigation district. The irrigation district runs through a property underneath and goes out the other side. You can, if you zoom up there, you, you'll be able to see a little uh, pipe going into the ground. Oh, I see it. You see it by the canal. That's uh -huh. the irrigation water that goes underground, comes up, we have a meter, and then that comes back down and it empties into this pond. Into here. Well, we, we added this big yellow pipe here as an extension to get that water directly into our irrigation system. So we're actually using the, the head pressure from the irrigation system uh -huh. to, to give us an additional 50 PSI to start with. So when okay. we run this centrifugal pump, we're saving a ton of power right now. So we currently just installed a controller that will pause our entire irrigation going out, put some back pressure on this, back flush all the algae back into the pond and then restart the irrigation all without us putting our hands on it so at all. So that can happen all wow. by itself. So then it comes through here. Um, you'll see all these little connections in here. And this guy is going to be coming in. Let's see, where's he going in? This guy goes into the actual right before the filters. This is phosphoric acid. Um, or is this copper? Sorry, this is copper sulfate. That's phosphoric acid. But the copper sulfate goes in and it basically acts as an algicide that kills off the algae so it doesn't grow in our filters. Okay. So that injects right before the filter and then it, it ideally eats itself up on this stuff and then we'll go through the line. So we have our A tank, we have our B tank, and we have our uh, acid tank. And I'll show you those in a minute. But those are all injecting proportional to the amount of gallons going through the line. Okay. So for every 1,000 gallons going through the line, we specify, I want this much of this, I want this much of that, and I want this much of this. The acid is actually controlled by a pH machine. Um, and because you want to control, just like when you're growing, I'm sure when you're growing dragon fruit, you want a certain pH range for the mm -hmm. water and the soil. Coming yes. In. We want a specific pH. Uh, I think it's like 5.3. It should be listed up here. So it's more acidic. 6.1, Yeah, so we're keeping the water at 6.1, um, and that's a self-feedback. So just so, slightly acidic, not bad. Yeah. So that's actually reading the water coming in and then resetting it over and over all the time as long as there's water. So then we come through here, we inject. Right after our injection, we have a static mixer. Um, that acts just like you would have a static mixer for grout or glue or whatever. Okay. Um, and it goes through there. This is a secondary filter. This thing we can take out and clean, as opposed to these you have to back flush and then refill the sand and all that. This one you can just pop it out and clean it by hand. This is our sort of last line of defense against any critters that are gonna block up. So this is your the, uh, final final clean. Yep, this is your last chance. And then the risers themselves have little filters on the hoses, Okay. but those were getting so plugged up we had to take them off. So right now this is our last line of defense. And when there's really heavy algae growth in the summer, like during an algae bloom or something, We'll be cleaning this guy out three three times a day sometimes. Daily. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Three times a day? Wow. But that's, I mean, that's only if we're having a real big problem. Normally it would be like once or twice a week. Okay. We'll keep us going. 
Uh, but but if the if the pond is full of algae, then the sand filters get full of algae. Then this gets full of algae, and it just goes down the line, and then the lines get algae, and it'll actually grow inside the lines and get worse. And it can become a it's nightmare. A so nightmare. Okay. between the copper and the phosphoric acid, we're really trying to keep the pH in a place where we can't grow any algae in here. And that six point one or whatever is the is is the magic number. That's our that's our number, and that'll change during different times of the year slightly. But that's okay. all. So it's going to change during August if it's hotter. Yeah. yeah, we when it's when it's hot outside, we use this machine to inject calcium and potassium. Oh, what do you? How do, what's calcium and potassium do? Um, calcium is for rind. Okay, um, so a thicker it's another, rind. Right? It crossover with dragon fruit as well, actually. Um, you'll have thicker, thicker, more robust rinds that won't rot as easily. Okay, with more calcium, um, and then potassium. I don't know what potassium does. There, there, there's always something. Um, these guys are actually really hungry for calcium and potassium. It's one of the things we were hoping for from our experiment with coconut core because it's really high in potassium, but uh, it, it didn't it work didn't out. Work. It didn't work out. It's a, the problem with the coconut core that we ran into was it was just, it's a very sensitive tree. It's very sensitive to temperature. It's very sensitive to wetness. And the coconut core wasn't getting it wet enough um, or dry enough. It was kind of staying in between where we wanted to be as so far the as the, plant wasn't the wetness of the root zone. And so we never really got the growth we were hoping for there. Um, but anyways, so this is our mixing tank. So we mix throughout the year. We have different mixes of fer fertilizer that we want to be, um, big. Yeah. There'll be some agitators inside there. Um, we have different, I think we have, so we have phase one, which is no fertilizer. We have phase two, which is high nitrogen, but then phase two is broken up into 2.1 and 2.2. We have phase three, 3.2, phase 4.1 and 4.2. So you fertilize so often. <laughs> there's seven phases of different levels of fertilization. Damn. Um, and you know, we'll start with the high nitrogen mix for bud differentiation and to get enough nitrogen stored in the tree. But if you put nitrogen in late season, the, the tree realizes, hey, I'm getting nitrogen. That means I'm healthy. I'm going to stay alive. So the tree will want to go vegetative instead of fruit growth. Uh, okay. So not only does it get your tree to have a bunch of suckers coming out when you don't want the suckers, it also keeps your fruit green. Because if you think about the tree as a unit that's trying to prop it, perpetuate its genes through a long period of time it'll see that it's going to be healthy for a long time and it'll it'll basically say what the equivalent human interaction would be of i there will be time to procreate later right now i should focus on personal growth right okay. um and so the tree goes into that mode and then you're suddenly you're not growing your good beautiful sweet fruits with the robust rind that looks beautiful and tastes beautiful you're getting these green little rock hard guys that they say if the seeds this year don't make it that's okay we'll be here next year that's what the tree and that's all because of too much nitrogen is. yep okay now if you put that nitrogen on and the tree's flush full of nitrogen and happy during bud differentiation it'll take that nitrogen and say we have enough stock here to put out a good seed year so as long as it's keeping that nitrogen coming in when the thing starts, you'll actually get bigger fruit in the beginning. So you want nitrogen in while there's fruit on the tree and before there's fruit on the tree, but when the fruit gets to a certain point, you need to stop. Okay. And what do you switch to, potassium? Well, you're always putting potassium in. Okay. And so we have, uh, I won't, uh, we contract with a guy who helps us build like a custom mix for our fruit based on our soil and our water and all that stuff. So. Because we contract with him, I can't go over exactly what all we put in it. No secrets. But it's various. We, we're, we're always putting in various levels of NPK and then micronutrients. We've got copper, uh, boron, molybdenum. Um, Is the iron one? Uh, you want to, you wanna, yes, we do use iron because there's, there's one of our tanks you'll see has like a bunch of red stuff in the bottom of it. Um, and then calcium, uh, phosphorus. Well, that's the P in NPK, I guess. Um, and there's one more that I'm missing. 
It'll come to me or it won't. We'll have to decide on that later. <laughs> these are our proportional injectors. So that's all controlled through the computer. Okay. And these tell us, we tell these every time we set an irrigation up, I want you to do this amount, you know, this ratio of fertilizer to um, So you're, in other words, water. you're always injecting something when you're watering? Except for phase one, okay. which is uh, from after harvest until we we start our fertilization program. Okay, so, so there is one, an off season yeah. of just pure water. Yeah, but we don't normally put a lot of water on during that season because that's the rainy season. Mm -hmm. And you don't really need to, these things don't drink a lot over the winter. So you actually want to dry them out as much as possible because when you dry them out, they get healthier roots. We're always trying to put just as much water on as the tree needs today, okay. no more. So we have sensors and we dig roots daily during the summer to see how deep is the water going, how wet is it at each level. Uh, ideally, we would like our root zone to be about this deep. We'd like eight to 10 inches in the top okay. for okay. all of our roots to be. And you wanna keep that wet enough that it's drinking, but dry enough that you don't start to get root rot there because you can put too much water there and you'll get alternaria which is the rotting disease. Same thing that comes on the fruit when the fruit starts to rot on the outside. Uh, it's a type of mold, you can smell it. It's why we put the phosphoric acid in there. Okay. And so you want to use that season after the fruit comes off when you don't need the tree to be growing because it's too cold. You want to use that season to rebuild your roots and kind of like get your roots to sit out in the mat where they're supposed to be. So that when the time comes that you have to put a lot of water on, there's enough roots there to suck it all up. Okay. So we're trying to get those surface roots back, putting just enough water on so that the tree knows there's water available here without overdoing uh, and, and causing some sort of root rot. Last year we had some problems with root rot and we had to do like a six week intervention with phosphorus and all this different stuff. Really? And yeah. that was all caused by overwatering? Yeah, okay. just by keeping the root zone too wet. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's not overwatering like a waterlog mm -hmm. thing, it's just could be better. I mean, you're talking about optimizing the last 10 percent at okay. that point this is our frost line on the left that only turns on when it's water then you'll see a third hose with the little green buttons on it that's our old drip line we're not using that anymore because it wasn't correct and then this guy that you're holding right there that's our drip line has internal drippers you can see in there there's a little button oh, okay so that's actually inside the hose and that gives out uh, i think it's a third of a gallon per hour so this is the emitter it's all built yeah. in now okay. it's built inside the hose what is it, like every 18 inches or something? Uh, 36 inch, uh, it, well, it's either 36 or 18, depending on where we run two lines, we run them at 36. Okay. And then where we run, run one line, we run them at 18. Um, it, the point of doing two lines is because you've got that, uh, the, you've got the entire berm that we want the root zone to be in. And you want the root zone to be in the berm because that'll heat up faster in the morning. Um, and so you you know as soon as that sun gets on the berm it's heating up and then the sooner the the roots are warm the tree becomes active okay so growing on a berm you're going to have your trees become active faster than yep. not on a berm and you're going to get less waterlogged when you have a rain event because uh, it drains out of the berm and it goes down into the flat ground beneath so you're actually using your water more efficiently and you're keeping your root zone from getting overly waterlogged. And you were saying you can control this whole watering system from your phone, huh? Yep. So that's all just on my phone. I go to a website um, and then I can schedule how long I want it to go. During the summer, we'll sometimes do eight or nine irrigations per day, oh, wow. but only half an hour at a time. Um, and we're, we're working really hard in that to put, we actually, are you guys familiar with evapotranspiration? Sounds fancy. <laughs> so it's called, we call it ET. Um, there's ET not and ET actual. Um, and basically ET not is a reference for how much water will come out of grass on any given day. And it's a function of wind, solar radiation, heat, um, and humidity. Okay. And so they'll calculate that at, uh, it's called CIMIS. It's like a California Institute of Irrigation Management System, something like that. Um, so CIMIS calculates the ET and we actually have a weather station down there that calculates ET as well okay and then we use a coefficient for the type of trees and how dense they are planted to say per acre we need this many inches of water per day mm. okay. so then we translate that into a number of hours because we know how many inches per hour we put out and so we're actually irrigating 
every day we sit and set up the irrigation for today. Got it. Some people do it. A lot of people will irrigate for 48 hours and then just wait for the ground to dry out and mm-hmm. then irrigate for 24 hours and wait for the ground to dry well, out and just go efficient. back and forth. No, because way. a bunch of that water dumps through and the tree's too wet for a while and too dry for a while. Mm-hmm. So that's not ideal. What we're saying is we want to keep our root zone as dry as possible, but still be utilized. So we only want to put as much water on today as the tree will drink today. Um, we don't want so any every water day to is a through. case by case scenario. Yeah, based off of all the factors that go into this formula. Yep. Okay. So we're we have a piece of software that will give us a number each day, this many hours, on your irrigation. Do you feel system. that that's accurate? It's it's helped. It we're working out the kinks. Plus, it saves you money from yeah. not overwatering and yeah. water being so expensive. Well, I mean. we're we're probably able to water. We're probably able to get the same fruit out of seventy to eighty percent of the water of people who aren't using. So you're saving like twenty methods. to thirty yeah. percent, wa- of your water bill. Well, and then on our trellis, when we get into that, we're watering our big trellis. We're probably watering about ten percent more than our big sumos, and the production on that's probably fifty percent higher. Wow! So for ten percent more water, we get fifty percent more fruit. Mm. And what's that? Wh- why is that payout so big? What's the factor, in your opinion, to cause that? So there's two things going on. One, um, and this is the, also the same reason we try to keep the root zone really high. Every the water comes in the plant at the root and it leaves at the leaf, and every bit of travel in between there costs. It costs nutrients and it costs solar energy. Mm-hmm. So we're basically solar farmers. We're trying to maximize the amount of sun that we can get into the plant and out through the fruit every year. And so when you have one of these trees, for instance, I've got good sun exposure here on this whole south side. I've got almost no sun exposure in between these. Right. Okay. And then on the north side, I have very low sun exposure because it's the north side and you know the sun gets up to here and then goes back. It never crosses it comes the bridge. All the way over, right. right. So if you look at north sides of the tree here, Look at the leaf size compared to south sides of the tree and look at the density, right? Oh. It's not the same. So this, you can even just grab one and compare them. Yeah, and part and of that is, well, that's not quite fair to compare right. a new yeah. leaf to an old leaf. Yeah, that's but, true, that's true. Um, but just generally, I yeah. see the difference, you yeah. Can just look at the overall. Don't don't give yourself an unfair advantage. So you're gonna get a lot more fruit on the south side? Not necessarily no. more fruit, but okay. the fruit will sweeten up faster, it'll color up faster, um, and you basically have to keep the tree open enough um, to harvest the right amount of sunlight on all around. So, so like, would you get a higher quality fruit on the south side then? Theoretically, but okay. it, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into it. It's anytime you ask me, I know you're probably asking me a question I could just say yes to, but I'm always going to hedge because well, there's too many factors. So many and things yeah, go into yeah. it that you could never. Um, <laughs> but. So last year we actually went in and cut holes in all these trees. We all say cut holes, but we have a certain number of scaffolds going up on these. And so like we made a big cut here. This this probably would have been crowded out. It's probably this cut here. This this piece was coming up and shading all this. Okay. So we made a cut on this side and a cut on this side to get the sun in, in to between these trees. increase the sun. Yeah. Okay. So you're thinning out in between the trees as you... As you so you're pruning to maximize the sunlight. sunlight infiltrating into yep. the makes growth. sense so if i've got a tree like this the outer foot of it can get sunlight and really only the outer 170 degrees of the outer foot of it can get great sunlight and if i put a tree like this and the sun's going to start here and go like this i'm actually getting morning sun yep i'm getting afternoon sun mm-hmm. on both sides um and then as I come over, I'm getting afternoon sun on this side. So I'm actually able to harvest a ton more sunlight per square foot. So that's the advantage of the trellis. That's the advantage of the trellis. And then we, we prune the trellis such that there's only a foot on the outside of every trellis. Uh, okay. So there's no space wasted in between. So instead of me getting one tree like this that I can get the outer two feet of all the way around, I'm actually getting three more surface trees. Area. Like triple the amount, basically. Yeah, so uh, I might have a hundred pieces of fruit. You know, these aren't the right numbers, but they're close enough to work with. I might have a hundred pieces of fruit per tree down there, but in every nine feet, there's three trees. Whereas here, there's nine feet in between a tree, and I can maybe put 200 pieces of fruit on it. 
And because the roots are closer to the fruit on the smaller tree, it's using less water and less nutrient to transport that nutrient to the fruit. It's also getting more sun per square foot than this thing, you know, I, you've got tree all the way through here, but really only this much tree is worthwhile. Yep. So deep so in here, it's all a, that's wasted. Yep. If we do have any fruit in here, we actually shell it out and pull it off because really? it's worthless. Okay. So it doesn't even yeah. taste good. Awful. Wow. Awful, awful, okay. awful. I'll find you an inside fruit. I'll make you eat it. Real. <laughs> <laughs> inside later. baseball. So really it's just the outer fruit are the sweetest. Yeah, we can, uh, but I'm sort of biased. I like eating these no matter what. Well, <laughs> he knows the difference though. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Let me know. This one, well, it might surprise you. It might be a good one. This one had good texture on the outside. It's still good. Nope. Paul still likes it. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> it's got some good sugar in it. It's not as sweet as the other ones though, that we've had earlier today. And it doesn't have that distinctive sumo flavor. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, interesting. Right. It's kind of the worst of both worlds. It's not as sweet and it's not as tangy. Yeah, you're so. right. I'd rather eat the outer fruit. <laughs> ah, we don't have to eat that one. <laughs> um, your sumo people are going to be like, why'd you waste it? I'm not it out. It just throws them on the ground. So this has two root stalks. So SS slash C to SC slash C. So which, so the one on the, the skinnier one, like, what is the purpose of this again? It's that it's going to send, get two. One was so a vegetative. One is more vegetative growth oriented and one is um, maybe more hardy to frost or and this whole block better. is like that. No, just this, just a few trees in this okay. row. Just a few trees. Yeah. So they have two separate variety rootstocks yep. that are combined two together. Rootstocks, and then when you're done with the one, if you ever need to take one out for any reason, you can just cut it off. So literally just cut right there. Yep. And then that would be done. It would be no. And if you food. had to, you could cut off this big one, and it would still grow. It would still grow. It wouldn't. It wouldn't have enough roots probably for the whole tree because there's a dominant. Like here's dominant another one. growing off of okay. that one, and this is just growing it. The I same way that one. you would graft a scion onto a onto a seedling. Okay. You would slice it. You would make vertical cuts across the top. You peel the bark back. Okay. And then you put the wood in contact with the wood, uh, and then you put the. The wrap it up the, with that tape. Wrap, it, wrap back. it back up with the grafting tape. That makes and sense. And it stays in place long enough that, the, that they start growing together. Got it. And they're different. This one's, there's still a dominant and a passive, but this one's bigger. Yeah. Than the other one. Yeah, so, the one's always bigger. And yeah, one's dude, smaller. that's... And what's the benefit of this, you think? Is that it's going to be allow it to be cold, so, grow faster, so despite the cold. We're, there's a few, I mean, all these different rootstocks have different advantages. So... This entire grove is on a Carrizo rootstock. And so the advantage of that is it's resistant to lime-induced chlorosis. So if you have a heavy lime block and you see, uh, sometimes you'll drive through, a, drive by a citrus grove and you'll see there's maybe a horizontal or a vertical or even a diagonal line running through it. And all the trees on this side of the field look yellow and all the other ones look great. Oftentimes that's a thing called lime-induced chlorosis. And what that is, is it's a disease that causes the roots to rot. And that's started by there being too much lime in too the soil. Too much lime. Well, Carrizo is more resistant to lime, but it doesn't make the fruit quite as sweet. So you have an advantage of being resistant to lime. You have a disadvantage of, sweetness. of the sweetness. Okay. Now, the flip side of that is you'll have a lot more vegetative growth on a Carrizo tree. So if you're trying to get it up to the top of the trellis faster and get to full production faster, it's faster. But then you might be able to harvest later in the season. So if you have a really early grove and you want to take advantage of, say, early fruit, you may not get that on the Carrizo rootstock because it doesn't sweeten up as fast. Okay. Carrizo also doesn't stay on the tree as long. The fruit falls apart faster. So that's not a good mix of traits right there. It's yes. slow to sweeten and doesn't last on the tree very long. So that's another consideration. You might have something like Rangpur, which is a lime uh, rootstock. And that is very vegetative and grows very fast. There's C2, which is a hybrid rootstock. Um, there's... Uh, C35 is a hybrid between Carrizo and Trifoliate, I believe. Don't quote me on that. Um, but it's kind of got some of the some of the characteristics of both. So, so the idea of inarching is, say, maybe I want a highly vegetative tree that grows really fast and is resistant to lime, uh -huh. but I still want some sweetness in my fruit. I might take a Carrizo and inarch a Trifoliate. 
to try to get the sweetness. And I may let that tree grow for three years and then enarch it and see if I can get some Oh, of so those. you can do it later. You can delay you can do it late. early and late. Oh, so okay. when you break that connection between, it'll break the it'll break the chain that's causing those characteristics to come. So you could add another variable, a root stock, and it could change the flavor profile of the fruit. It could change the flavor profile of fruit. And let's say you, you arched in something like C35 that's super vegetative. Uh, it's going to grow really fast. It's going to get up there super good. But now your trees are older and you're not getting the maturity you want on your fruit. Maybe you cut that out. It's done its job and then you're going to move on with your life. Oh, so you could change them over time. Yeah. Okay. Wow. That is such a cool method. I'm surprised it's new. It's kind of in its infancy, right? Not many people are doing it. I've never seen a full production grove doing this yet. Um, now I believe it's done in Brazil, but I've never been there to see it. I think my dad might've seen it. What do you, production. what do you think of so far your anecdotal evidence after trying it? Um, do you feel it's worthwhile or has potential possibly? I think it definitely has potential. I, I, I think our next planting will, will, will be in arching, a very vigorous but not overly useful uh, uh, rootstock into the side. And okay. then uh, my father will know more about what exact rootstock we want to put in. guys a quick show here before we run out of light this is what a grove of trellises looks like before it's planted the irrigation system is installed it just hasn't been planted yet and then once we cross the next drive row up there you'll see some chernuis that have just been planted that are still babies okay. they were planted this summer probably have about four months of growth underneath them already so pull up in one of these rows next to me and I'll meet you on the other side So it's day two here at George's Sumo Citrus Farm, and you can see it's obviously raining heavily. So what do you do differently to uh, adapt to these conditions? Well, on a good day, we're staying inside, hopefully working in the barn, getting that reorganized because by the time harvest comes around, it's a mess in there. <laughs> but first, we're getting everything ready to drain. Um, things on a hill. Uh, don't don't like rain too much necessarily. We've got all these pathways all the way up and down here uh, And these all have to drain through the berms because the, the, the slope is against where our the direction of our berms uh, Over on our other hill over here our berms are the same direction as the slope So that's not a problem, but where we're in the counter direction. I've got to clean all these leaves out so they don't get clogged um, All this water will drain down the front and it's going to cut through the berm We'll probably get a chance to walk through the grove and look at it a little bit more, but first what we have to do is just clear all this stuff out. And how many rows do you have to do this? Uh, this, this row has about 34 rows, I think. So it's um, gonna take some time to do all the rows, right? Yeah, it's not too bad. Maybe an hour or two at the start of rain and then you go out uh, again, especially if the rain picks up. Okay. You're gonna be out there a couple more times just to keep it clear. And it's, you know, some stuff's gonna get in there and it's gonna get clogged up, but for the most part, you want a big open channel like this. We've gone through and we've actually dug these out and cut at the spots that's the lowest. You look at the first year, you just kind of look at where the water pools the most. Mm -hmm. And then you cut and then you need, you'll have a channel down to the next area and you'll find your next low spot. And that makes sense. And then as you go through, you kind of get an idea of where the water's going and you can adjust it manually. But this, this is flowing here. You'll actually see when it gets heavier, it'll flow across this road as well. Okay, I'm gonna so I'll clear that out right now. Uh, but 
we're basically just trying to get all this water that's channeling out of our entire yard area to have a place to go without either going towards the house or pooling somewhere. Anywhere the water pools just stays wet forever and causes problems and is a breeding ground for disease. So, Well, right now, so if you imagine being in a bathtub, um, you sit in the bathtub and your hands get super soft, your pores open up and, um, you know, like if you were to, again, I think we talked before about if you scrub your hands when they're wet, a lot more skin comes off. Well, that openness and that weakness affects the rinds exactly the same way. So that water is actually penetrating. Um, I showed you before there's some micro cracks in the necks of those things. Yep. So that water will actually fill up inside on some of those and okay. it'll, it'll stay wet if it doesn't get a chance to dry out and it'll rot the fruit from the inside out. Um, so you're you know. losing money if that happens. <laughs> Boy, howdy. Um, yeah, like I said before, man, we lost we lost over half of our crop. Probably about 35% of our crop was left last yeah. year um, after all the rain and all the damage. But as a farmer, I'm never going to be sad that it's raining. I mean, that, we yeah. don't have that in our blood either. We need it for next year. We need it for this year even. It's a blessing so. in some ways. The, the timing is key. Well, like right. every farmer says, I want it to rain, just not today. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. That's true. So uh, it's a tough line to walk, but you can't ever be sad when it's raining. I mean, we we hope for it. We pray for the rain all the time, man. I mean, that's like number one right there. So um, it's cool that you guys got here during your rain. It doesn't rain often here, but yeah. you get to see a few things that you wouldn't otherwise get to see. Uh, you know, a lot of the citrus guys will say, I've killed a lot more trees by overwatering than I have by underwatering. So that's actually one of the advantages of our berm system. If you look at maybe this bit of ground right here uh, versus, this is a bad example, I guess, because this is a road, but if you look at how wet the berm is here versus how wet it is in between the rows, right? you'll have big, thick, sticky mud. And then this is just kind of, this is a lot more organic material. So the soil, it drains a lot better. Yeah, it looks drier. Yeah, it looks well, well draining so far. So we kind of keep ourselves from drowning the roots. I talked about the berm and the root zone. So let's take a second and go over that right now if you guys have sure. a set. Let's do it. So the, the way we build our berms, we're trying to be like four feet wide and two feet tall. And that obviously knuckles down over time. Um, but we want like a eight inch deep root zone so that all of our uh, all of our water sits in this berm and sublimates out to the sides of it. And we want basically there to be giant mats of roots. So this um, is the main zone for your irrigation and fertigation and yeah. your whole root zone is right here. Yeah, that's correct. So yesterday we talked a bit about fertigation. Uh, we talked a little bit about pulsing, but, but really what we do with our pulsing is we put just enough water to fill only the berm with water without pushing any water down further than that. That does two things. One, we don't push nitrates into the soil that'll get into our water table. Um, so ideally, I mean, it won't actually work out that way because our well water is coming from somewhere up the mountain and hundreds of years of over fertilizing have done this and that. Uh, well, but I mean, probably not hundreds of years since it came out after World War II. But anyways, <laughs> it's definitely nitrogenated soil and definitely most of it isn't traditionally used. We're actually able to cut our fertilizer use down to about a quarter of what we used to use just on regular orange trees here. Oh, wow. By using berms and pulsing our irrigation and putting out just as much nutrient as it'll use at a time. So it increases efficiency. Yeah. Okay. Uh, traditionally, you'd have like a slug of fertilizer go in all at once or like a granular fertilizer dropped on it. Mm -hmm. And then that granular fertilizer would get washed down through. The tree would take as much as it can before that gets washed down. but they used to actually flood irrigate all the citrus. So if you flood irrigate and, and have uh, and have fertilized beforehand, you're actually washing 80% of your fertilizer down into the water table, which then pollutes the water, causes it so that you can't have control. Um, how much nitrogen gets put on at what time is actually really sensitive for the sumo. There's a friend of ours right now, wasn't able to pick any of his fruit before the rain uh, because he has uh, an equivalent of 80 pounds per acre foot of nitrogen in his well water. So it's just high, and, high saturated with nitrogen. So the problem is, is the, the nitrogen keeps the fruit green because the fruit stays in a vegetative state instead of trying to mature the fruit. So you get this green fruit that's sugar's high, your acid's low, bricks are perfect, but it's not good enough for the consumer to be, to be purchasing it. If you're looking at two sumos in the store and one's green and one's orange, which one are you going to buy? 
one door. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the general sentiment of the consumer. So um, part of it's consumer education, part of it's just good good marketing and good farming practices. But yeah, so because his ranch isn't on a water district, it's all based off of well water, he's actually having to uh, harvest after this rain, which will probably lose a percentage of his crop. So that's basically just biting him. Um, all that to say, it's really important to control the amount of nitrogen in your soil. So we can actually, uh, we can actually flush our entire berm out in one or two irrigations. These guys' roots only need to go a foot and a half in either direction, but then eight inches deep. And you can get a lot of really healthy, helpful roots in that. And healthy plants, these trees are extremely healthy. Yeah, and, and the, productive the trees are staying happy for sure, but it's definitely an advantage to have a place where you can control the amount of water in it. And the sun will come out and it'll dry this out real quick. Um, whereas, you know, if you've got that flat sort of Porterville clay that turns into bricks, Water doesn't move through it as easily. So uh, another thing that helps is you don't have to amend the soil in the whole grove. You only have to amend the soil in the berm. Just on the berm. Yeah, so we actually, every year, we add calcium and dairy screenings. And the dairy screenings are denitrogenated, so they've actually set in a settlement pond, mm -hmm. and they'll scoop that water off and use that to make nitrogen. And then after it's been denitrogenated, we take just the organic material, and we add calcium to it in the form of gypsum and we spread it just right up on the berm so it keeps the berm from degrading and increases the organic matter over time. And you're being really efficient with your fertilizers too, or your additives. Yeah, so then all of our all of our additives are done through the water line. We're not ever dropping any powders. Um, I mean, the gypsum is a powder, but that's that's an amendment to the, to the additional organic matter we're adding to the soil. We're not ever adding any powdered nitrogen or granular nitrogen or anything. It's all gets mixed in that mixing tank I showed you guys mm -hmm. before, and then it, every one of these drippers is basically a fertilizer station as well as a watering station. Yeah, it's dual so that's purpose. Every 36, you know, every 18 inches, or if there's two lines, every 36 inches offset with each other throughout the whole grove. Do most of the citrus farms grow on these types of um, setups here with the, the elevated soil, or do they grow them typically on flat? So plains? there's some of both. Um, in the 80s, there wasn't a lot of berms. We had a really heavy rain period in the 80s mm -hmm. um, to the point that uh, you could dig a hole in your grove. You could stick the shovel in and pull a scoop of dirt out of the ground and it would fill level with water. Oh, the, wow. the groves were that saturated. Wow. And a lot of people lost entire groves during that time because of the root rot. Um, and then uh, after that, people started seeing the value of berms as a way just to keep you out of the water. Now we have the opposite problem, right? We don't have any water right now. Yep. And these things always go back and forth in cycles. And then during the wet times, more water gets appropriated. Mm -hmm. And so then when you go back to the dry time, you have less than you started with before because now more of it's appropriated somewhere else. Yep. More people are fighting over a limited supply. Um, so the, the berms help us know exactly where the roots are so that we're actually in addition to help us from overwatering when it's wet, they also help us um, to use less water when it's dry because we know exactly where our roots are and we just put water right there. Okay. So on these trellises, we're actually getting about 1.5 times as much production off the same amount of water, or maybe up to 10% more water just because wow. there's more trees. But there's three times as many trees as a normal grove here. So the ones upstairs are planted nine feet apart. Uh -huh. The ones here on the trellis are planted three feet apart. This is like high density. Is what Super high density. Right. But each tree only gets about half as much fruit on it. So we might only put a hundred pieces per tree on the trellis mm -hmm. that's fully mature. Whereas we'll have a, around 200 pieces on the uh, conventional trees that are fully so mature. So high density, you get less fruit per tree. Yes. Okay. That's correct. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's its about half as much fruit per tree, but three times as many trees, so it comes out to 1.5. So it ends up being better yeah. in the long run. And there's no other ill effects. I mean, the fruit, the trees seem really healthy. The fruit seems nice size. I mean, it's its maintenance, right? You, mm -hmm. couldn't, you couldn't farm it the same way that you farm a conventional grove. You're always in here. You're always maintaining how it's on the trellis. Um, you'll look at these lemon trees right here. This is just an experimental area we have here to see how lemons do, but these were completely cut back to the wires uh, about six months ago. 
So just in six months, it's yeah. prolific growth. Has now, occurred. lemon trees are very vivacious. Uh -huh. uh, they have a ton of growth all the time. So that's not the same as a sumo tree. But it's the same concept because what will happen is then that'll choke out all the growth inside. Um, and so we actually have a program that we're developing right now for our trellises where we're cutting one of the main branches off or, or two of the main branches off each year. And then and that way, every three years, the, the lateral branch is renewed mm -hmm. uh, because younger wood produces better sumos. So if we can get into oh, a good okay. rhythm uh -huh. um, where, you know, every three years, this lateral is replaced. So you have one, you know, two good growing years, year two, year three, good growing years, year one, a reset year. Um, then you never have your whole tree need to be reset all at once and move out on a whole season. So how you prune can really affect your crops in the future. Yeah, and it's expensive to prune. So you're you're balancing how much money am I getting versus how much maintenance am I doing. I don't know if you... Uh, there's a... The book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People talks about uh, production versus production ca capability and how you have to balance those. So any year you wanted to not prune, you could get a bunch of production that year. But now your production capacity is diminished because all your wood is old and you didn't open up a space for new wood to grow in. You have to balance with these things. How much money can I try to get out of it this year or how much fruit can I try to get out of it this year mm -hmm. versus how long is this tree going to live and continue to produce healthy fruit. And if I prune more this year, it's going to pay off in the long term versus I need to prune less this year yeah. to get more production. Well, but, you know, the, that... But also, you got to prune some in order to get production because just like a dragon fruit, yeah. when you tip it, uh -huh. when you cut back on them, the tree comes back with a vengeance, and so it'll throw a bunch of buds. You ideally want to prune somewhat right before its blooming season because when that new growth comes out, you want it to stretch six inches, eight inches, and then drop a piece of fruit on the end of that. So you need to so prune need at a specific time of year. Yeah, so you got to prune it at the right time of year so that you promote that growth. What you time want, of year is that on a sumo? Uh, we try to do our pruning, uh, we try to have our pruning done by March, but we like to start late January, early February. So you have about three months where you can, two or three months. Yeah, okay. so, the, you know, these bigger these bigger farms that have hundreds of acres, they've just got to get it done when they can as soon as harvest is done. But you really want to have it finished probably a couple weeks before you start throwing any buds. Okay. So you really want to have it done by like the first, second week of March. So that is what I've learned about the Sumo Citrus, the amazing Sharanui Decopon, which is a hybrid of Pokan, Setsuma, and Trovita. Now, remember, this fruit has many names depending where it's from. You could buy the trees under Sharanui Decopon. You could buy a Sumo Citrus Mandarin like you see here. Or in South Korea, they call these a Hellebalong. And in Brazil, they call them Kinse. So these plants were introduced in 2005 to the university. And now you can see that they've been on the market since 2011. So you can own your own Shernui Decapon. As you can see we have here, I actually have two trees and I'm really excited to grow these to the standard that the George family had taught me. So what an amazing experience. Thank you so much, Tim and Mike and the entire George family for allowing Scott and I to learn about the amazing Sumo Citrus. So thanks for watching. We appreciate your support. Give us a like and a subscribe. Have yourself a wonderful day. Take care and keep your eye out at your local nurseries because you can grow this amazing fruit at home too if you live in the right climate, right? All right, thanks for watching. Have a great day. Take care.